Welcome to the Prairie Oaks Bible Study. And we're still in our series of the Ten Commandments. And we've made it through the first five, where it is one God, God first. And the second, do not make idols. Uh, the third is to not take the Lord's name in vain. Fourth is to remember the Sabbath. And then the fifth is to honor your mother and father. And as we move to the other table, uh, the last five, we find do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie, and do not covet. And looking at these, you know, it would be easier to preach to about those people, you know, the ones that do things we disagree with in breaking the commandments. But kind of grieved, really grieved this, this week. And it's interesting that this is really coming up as we come to these. And I'll tell you why. It goes back to Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment. And Jesus said, well, the greatest, the foremost commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. The second, right up there with it, greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all the rest of the law and the, and the prophets. And so he summed it up with those two commands. And we saw that the first summary commandment, to love God with all of our heart, we don't really do that very well. It's been very grievous to see our sin and, and know that as much as God has loved us, it's easy for us to forget about him. Now we look at how he summed up the last half, to love your neighbor as yourself, and if I was to spend that time preaching against those people, I would be fueling our disobedience of this commandment, to love our neighbor as ourself. Because the disturbing trend is that we're losing our ability to see other people as people, as human beings, made in the image of God. And we don't love them as we love ourselves. And you may say, well, why do you say that? Well, think about some of these examples. As you're driving down the road, yelling at the people in front of you or behind you or around you because they don't drive right. What about uh, trolling someone on social media because we disagree with what they said? or sitting on the couch, or in the recliner, cursing at uh, the talking heads because we disagree with their policies. James asked a very pointed question. Is there blessing and cursing coming out of the same mouth? You really think you can bless God and curse his image bearer? These things ought not to be so, James said. And if it doesn't, and if it isn't convicting enough, then we have town meetings in our town even, in towns around us. And we find that people that we thought were Christians are saying horrible things to other people. Emailing them, texting them, saying it to them in their, to their face. We've lost our love your neighbor as yourself. We being me, it's easy to not do so. We being us as Christians, first and foremost, it's in our laps. And if the word of God does not affect us first, then we have no reason to expect it to change anyone else out there that 
their lives need changed as well. In fact, if we're to be known by our love, our love for one another, and we don't have it, then that's what we'll be known for, is our lack of love. Instead of being the salt of the earth, we'll just be known as being salty. Instead of being known as a different people, we'll just be known as divisive people. We are losing our opportunity. We are the hindrance to revival. So let's kind of dig into this. Here in Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5, starting in verse 43. I mean, he's already touched on each of the commandments uh, here with, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you not to hate. You shall not commit adultery. But I say you commit adultery in your hearts. I say you should not lie. But I say to you, you've made up systems for lying and swearing oaths and not keeping them. And then he gets to verse 43 and he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father in heaven, that he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word from Jesus Christ himself. If you have a red letter Bible, it's in red letters. Although all of it is words from God. From in the beginning, in Genesis, to even so, Lord, come quickly, amen, and revelation. It is all the word of God. And he has been preaching emphatically here. What are my people to be known for? They're known to, for how they mourn. They're known for how they are merciful. They are known for their humility, their meekness. And that's just in the Beatitudes. They're known for being peacemakers. He wants us to be those people. He wants us to be those people. And then we get to here, and I think, again, it's easy to be like little Pharisees and categorize these so that we feel good about, oh, I would do it if circumstances were such and such. But Jesus says, no, I don't want you to do it in your chosen circumstances. I want you to do it all the time. All the time. Therefore, you shall be perfect. You shall be whole. You shall be complete. You shall be consistent in this. Just as your Father in heaven is consistent in this. These all the time things. So that whoever it is that we disagree with or frustrated with, we're still treating them with respect. And why can I say that? Because that's apparently the way Jesus lived his life. That's the way Jesus taught his disciples. He couldn't have taught them to do that unless he was doing it himself. Think about this. Um, concerned about appearing weak and, and a pushover? Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, as he sends out the disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Maybe sometimes we use that verse to call people wolves, but we've got to be reminded we're supposed to be sheep, not wolves. Be as wise as serpents. Does that mean I can bite everybody that, that frustrates me? Uh, the example he's giving there is that we'd be harmless as doves. So what is it about a serpent that makes them wise? 
they're hidden most of the time. We don't know where most of them are. And so they get out of the way. Wise as serpents, harmless, innocent as doves. We're called to be different in these dialogues and in these discussions of what is best. Because here's the thing is, what is best? Well, we come back to, it is to love others. It is to be concerned about others above ourselves. That is the example of Jesus. He came to put himself in harm's way for the betterment of others who really didn't even deserve it at that. God speaking of Jesus. This is an Old Testament quote. Matthew applies rightly to Jesus. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. The mission is the Great Commission. And so he says that's what we need to be striving for. But how do we strive? We're the ones that are gentle. The bruised reed he will not break. The ones that are high in tolerance. The smoking flax he will not quench. Not quarreling, not crying, yelling. People won't hear our voices in the street because we're yelling. Angry. Those aren't the things we're to be known for. What are the most important commandments? Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Jesus reiterated that command. Remember? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as you love yourself? No, as I have loved you. Laying down his life. And we find it hard to be inconvenienced for others. I don't know about you, but that convicts me. Jesus says I should lay down my life for others, and I don't even want to be inconvenienced by others. That's, that's a problem. That's where God's Spirit needs to be working in me, and I need to be asking Him to, as I realize this disparity between what Jesus taught and me as someone who claims His name not living up to it. Not taking the Lord's name in vain. Because the reality is I've put another idol in God's place. In itself. Self doesn't want to be inconvenienced by this. Don't. That's, that's where we're at. You know, our rights are important. But they serve they are to serve God's commands. We've been given liberty, the Apostle Paul says. So I guess going from what Jesus taught in the Gospels, how did the Apostles come away with applying these things? Well, you look at the Apostle Paul. He had rights as a Roman citizen. And he used them to further the kingdom, to serve God. But he allowed his rights to get trampled on in order to serve God. It would have been much safer to have stayed at home building tents and not raising a ruckus. He knew that following Christ was more important. His testimony. But I started to quote to you, one of Paul's early letters is the letter to the Galatians. And I will try to keep this short. But 
You can message me in the notes if you want to see all the Bible verses that I've pulled up from most of Paul's letters, from James, from Peter, from John's epistles. Numerous places that reinforce what I'm telling you here. But Paul told the Galatians in chapter 5, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Those whole serve one another's, love one another's, they are built upon this idea that others are just as, if not more important, than myself. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So he says we're not to use our liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Well, what is he talking about when he says that? Let me pick and choose through this list here of the works of the flesh in verse 19. You know, hatred, contention, being divisive looking for a fight. Outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambition. Dissension. Heresies. It's not talking about teaching false doctrine. It's trying to make a division in the church of God. It's being divisive again. Those are the works of the flesh. See, again, it's easier to point to other things and then ignore the ones that may be pointing back at us. Paul is emphatic. Those works are contrary to the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, that meekness, power but restrained for the good of others. Self-control. Against such there is no law. You won't find God telling you not to do those things. <laughs> and yet we don't want to do them. Now why is it so hard? Well, yeah, it's been a rough 18 months. We're tired, we're wore out, we're afraid, and we don't even want to admit it. And when we're afraid and we don't want to admit it, we usually lash out in anger. And so, yeah, kind of being rough on us here because it's the Word of God. And it's meant to be rough on us. But I want you to pause for a second here in Philippians. Again, another one of Paul's letters. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I want you to be known as being gentle, gracious. I want you to be known for that. A kindness. I want that. The Lord is close. The Lord is with you. I want that to be your motivation for why you're being gentle. But it's scary, Paul. Verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What if I don't feel the peace of God? Then go back to verse 6 and repeat. Be anxious for nothing. Don't fret. Don't fear, don't lash out, but with everything, in every circumstance, prayer, supplication, begging, thanksgiving, pause and say, oh, it's not as bad. I'm only looking at the negative. Also look to see what God is doing good. And I want to be a part of that. Let your request be made known to God.
Well, I did that twice and I still then do it a third, do it a fourth, do it until you get the peace of God that surpasses understanding to guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. One of our reasons we're struggling is because we're not praying and trusting God. We're better known for our fear than we are for our faith, unfortunately. But there's so much worrisome things out there. I mean, the news, the TV preachers, they're all giving us these bad news and, and these things. And maybe we need to think about something else, Paul says. Verse 8 says, finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, whatever things are true, there's a lot of lies being told out there. A lot of lies. And you don't probably realize how many lies you're being told and believing. Because you believe the person who's telling them to you. Who's also making the same mistake of believing it. But they're still not true. Well, what is true? The word of God that I hold in my hands right now. Whatever things are true. Whatever things are noble the things that give courage, whatever things are just, righteous, things that are obedient to God's commands like we've been talking about today, whatever things are lovely, what prompts love? Yep, he's real adamant about that one. Whatever things are of good report, whatever gives a good reputation to Jesus Christ. Filter those thoughts, filter those words, filter those comments through, does this make Jesus look good? Does this even reflect Jesus in my life? The Lord is at hand, remember? If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I could go on and on. So I challenge you to do this kind of homework for yourself. Go back through some of these that I just read to you from the Gospels, from Paul's letters. Maybe spend some time in James uh, when he's talking about the tongue. Uh, think about Titus. Uh, Titus chapter chapter 2 uh, and or was it chapter three? Uh, remind them of how to speak to others, to be gentle, showing all humility. Um, think about uh, the letter from James to the believers. Oh my goodness, James is so forthcoming. Like I said, what does this wisdom from above look like compared to what is the wisdom from below? Because the wisdom from above is peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Peter. Peter was talking to some folks who were in a hostile world. And he told them to be sheep. Maybe that doesn't ring with what you were hoping to to hear from God's word, but it's written throughout. After you spend some time in 1 Peter, go to, to 1 John. Uh, if you want some references for 1 Peter chapters 2 and 3, uh, go to 1 John. Look for how many times he tells us to love one another. And that if we don't love others, it's probably because we're not loving God. Maybe not even know who God is. Because we'll love the things that God loves, and he loves these people that disagree with us. I'm grieved. I'm grieved that in the basic things, many Christians have lost their way in being Christ-like. I pray that it's not you, but I suspect it's all of us if it starts with me. And so, 
let God's word have its work in us to bring us to repentance. That he would receive the glory. As we're going through challenging times, hospitals are full. And I'm not talking about the ones in other towns. I'm talking about the one that our ambulances stop at and can't get people in the emergency room because there's not room. Nurses are wore out. Doctors are wore out. I'm not talking about the ones in those big cities. I'm talking about the ones that come to my church. We've got a lot on our plate. And someone taught me somewhere there's two kinds of people. Part of the problem, part of the solution. Christians are called to be part of the solution. So let's be that. God bless, God keep you, and we'll see you soon.